Uh, let's talk about the federal courts. Most federal court cases don't get to the Supreme Court, right? The Supreme Court, Supreme Court gets all the attention, but um, they don't get that many cases. Every year, the Supreme Court gets asked to take like 5,000 or 10,000 cases. They only take about 100 of them, maybe 150 of them in a particularly busy year. So if, if your case is in federal court, any kind of case, that will be before a federal district court judge. If you don't like the ruling that district court judge gives you and you want to appeal that ruling, your appeal gets kicked upstairs to the federal appeals court, which is called the circuit court. Um, there's about a dozen federal circuit courts around the country. They're regional courts. And if the circuit court decides that they're going to take up your appeal in your federal case, it'll be circuit court judges that review your case. And for the vast, 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 vast majority of federal court cases, that's as far as you are ever likely to go. I mean, even if you don't like the circuit court ruling that you get, even if you want to take it further and you want to appeal it all the way to the Supreme Court, you are, statistically speaking, really not likely to get there. For federal cases, I mean, if you're going to get anywhere, the circuit court is almost always the end of the line. Supreme Court, again, gets all the attention, but it's, the, it's these federal appeals courts, these circuit courts that do the vast majority of the appellate work in the federal system. So these courts, circuit courts, are really powerful. They're really important. I mean, they're important for individual humans, individual federal cases, but also for big, important policy matters that end up in the courts for one reason or the other. The circuit courts are the highest that the, the vast majority of those cases will ever go. Circuit courts are also important because of the judges that sit on them. The circuit courts are the location from which presidents of both parties like to pluck young, promising appeals court judges when they're looking for a Supreme Court nominee. So circuit court judges have an important job. Um, they also, particularly when they are young and first nominated, they're really important decisions for presidents because those folks are often seen as the sort of bench from which Supreme Court nominees are chosen. And one of the most consequential, but also most boring political stories of the Trump era, uh, the Trump era and the McConnell era, is that the top Republican in the US Senate, Mitch McConnell, not only held a Supreme Court seat open during the Obama presidency, so President Obama wouldn't be allowed to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court, Mitch McConnell also held open dozens and dozens and dozens of other seats on federal courts across the country, including dozens of seats on these very important circuit courts, these appeals courts. So President Obama couldn't fill those seats either. And Mitch McConnell did that specifically so the next Republican president could appoint those judges instead. And that is how we got to the point where two something years into his time in office, President Trump is closing in already on the total number of circuit court judges that President Obama was ever able to appoint in his whole eight years in the White House. They just didn't let Obama appoint judges. They held those seats open on federal courts, including the appeals courts, these circuit courts, uh, and now because they held them open throughout Obama's presidency, now Trump is very quickly filling them all up. And these, of course, are lifetime appointments. As I said, this is a huge, super consequential and often very boring story of the Trump and Mitch McConnell era, except for the days when it is not boring. Um, part of the way the Republican Party, uh, both in the White House and in the Senate, has, has handled this great power that they have given themselves by manipulating the judiciary this way, part of the way they have dealt with this power is that they've uh, been a little punch drunk with it. Um, and with pretty good frequency, they have appointed wildly unqualified people to try to become federal judges, including some people who are literally explicitly rated unqualified by the American Bar Association. I mean, they have nominated people who have never tried a case, people who have never been involved in any way in litigation, literally people who have never stepped foot in a courtroom, they have appointed to lifetime roles on the federal bench. At one point, they tried to nominate a guy who was a famous ghost hunter. Sure, he was married to somebody who worked in the White House. They figured that was good enough. They also gave a lifetime appointment as a federal judge to Louisiana Senator David Vitter's wife, um, who, during the course of her nomination, basically blew off her Senate questionnaire about her background and experience, who totally bungled her confirmation hearing, including memorably refusing to say whether she believed Brown versus Board of Education was a good idea, whether we should go back to legally mandated segregation. 
Her nomination, and particularly her confirmation hearing, was such an embarrassing disaster, it actually looked like they were going to put her nomination on ice for good. Mitch McConnell only took it off the trash heap and rushed it through all in a hurry after the nominee's husband, former Senator David Vitter, lobbied Mitch McConnell to drop sanctions on a Russian oligarch and as soon as McConnell did that, Vitter came back to McConnell's office to let him know that the oligarch's firm was going to write a $200 million check to a new enterprise in McConnell's home state of Kentucky. Right after that, Mitch McConnell suddenly discovered, hey, David Vitter's wife's judicial nomination hadn't gone through after all. And he pulled it out of the circular file and rushed it through. And now Wendy Vitter is going to be on a federal bench until the end of her working life. So, I mean, that's how they have used this power, right? They have had some doozies. With great unfettered power comes wild irresponsibility, always and ever. Um, but this next document I'm about to show you, this is something, I have it here, don't I? Yeah. This document. Um, this is something that I never expected to have to read as part of my day job. It is a law review article that is titled Ethno-Nationalism and Liberal Democracy. Ethno-nationalism, ethnic nationalism. Like, we have been talking a lot in this country in recent weeks for obvious and terrible reasons about white nationalism, which is the new branding that domestic terrorists are using in this country for white supremacy. Um, here's the thesis statement of this ethno-nationalism law review article. Quote, this article argues that ethno-nationalism remains a common and accepted feature of liberal democracy that is consistent with current state practice and international law. Hmm. This is a long piece. It's over 60 pages. Uh, it was published in the University of Pennsylvania Journal of International Law uh, in 2010. Um, and it takes a sort of international tour of ethno-nationalism through the ages. But it ends with this sort of war cry about how a country can't work, how definitely democracy can't work unless the country is defined by a unifying race. Uh, quote, the idea that a sovereign democratic government represents a particular ethno-nationalistic community has its root in the principle of self-determination of peoples. Uh, he quotes the philosopher John Stuart Mill and Mill's definition of the sentiment of nationality. The author says that sentiment which facilitates democratic government, rests upon ethno-cultural ties. Ethno-national communities, ethno-cultural ties. Are you talking about what I think you're talking about? Oh, yes, you are. He gets right to it at the end. Quote, self-government requires a political partnership in which individuals are willing and able to regard one another as equal members of the political community. Democratic self-government depends on national fellow-feeling the capacity of citizens to identify with each other. Ethnic ties provide the groundwork for that social trust and political solidarity. Oh, at the same time, social scientists have found that greater ethnic heterogeneity is associated with lower social trust. Ethnically heterogeneous societies exhibit less political and civic engagement, less effective governing institutions, and fewer public goods. The sociologist Robert Putnam has concluded that greater ethnic diversity weakens social solidarity, fosters social isolation, and inhibits social capital. These findings confirm that the solidarity underlying democratic polities rest in large part on ethnic identification. Surely it does not serve the cause of liberal democracy to ignore this reality. The ethno-national identification of liberal democratic states is becoming more, not less, significant. Liberal democracy requires a national community if it is to become more than an ineffectual abstraction. And by national community, yes, he's talking about everybody having the same ethnicity. I mean, this is the, this is the you know, law review slash academic wordy bird argument that you can't really have a country, at least you can't have a country that works if you've got all sorts of different people in it, right? Surely it does not serve the cause of liberal democracy to ignore this reality. Right, that's how you know this is a highbrow argument for racial purity in the nation state when they say things like, surely everyone must admit this. Don't you just feel it in your gut? Um, the author of this slightly blood-curdling, very serious law review article is named Stephen Menashe. 
M-E-N-A-S-H-I, I think how you say it. Um, the reason you need to know it is because Donald Trump just nominated him to be a federal appeals court judge. Just nominated him to sit on the Second Circuit Court of Appeals, which is the federal appeals court that covers New York State and other parts of the Northeast. And um, you might wonder how the Trump administration finds the, you know, the academic drum major for ethno-nationalism to become a federal appeals court nominee, one level below the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, I, I, I tend to think that in academia and politics, these people on this fringe of racial thinking, they tend to find each other like magnets and iron filings do. Do you remember how back in the 2016 campaign, Trump used to tell this totally made up apocryphal story about how the way we used to get rid of terrorism is that we'd dip the bullets in pig's blood and wrap up the Muslims' bodies in pig skins. And that's how we got rid of Muslim terrorists in the past. And now we're just too wussy to do that. There's a little controversy in the 2016 campaign that he used to tell that made up story. Well, you know what? This guy who has just been nominated to be a federal appeals court judge has also made that same argument that Trump made on the stump in 2016. He has also told that same fake story in the course of his academic career. And I mean, this was crazy enough to hear candidate Trump run with this, this completely made up story during the 2016 campaign. He took the 50 terrorists and he took 50 men and he dipped 50 bullets in pig's blood. You heard that, right? He, fit, he took 50 bullets and he dipped them in pig's blood. And he had his men load his rifles and he lined up the 50 people and they shot 49 of those people. And the 50th person, he said, you go back to your people and you tell them what happened. And for 25 years, there wasn't a problem. Okay, 25 years, there wasn't a problem, all right? So we better start getting tough. Total bullpucky, not true at all. That story was not true when then candidate Donald Trump pulled it out of his proverbial fortune cookie and riled up that crowd in South Carolina with it during that campaign. It was also not true when Second Circuit Court of Appeals nominee Stephen Menashe argued it in a paper he published at Stanford University's conservative think tank. Look, same thing, same made up story. His forces captured some of the militants, executed them with bullets dipped in pig's fat. Oh, pig fat, not pig blood. Pershing's approach is probably no longer in the army's counterterrorism repertoire, but the result was that the guerrilla violence ended. The American response to Islamic extremism has not always been so harsh or as effective. Okay, I mean, it is one thing to have this fantasy, let's buy Greenland, you know, made up self-serving claptrap come out of the mouth of an anti-Muslim candidate who then becomes president of the United States. It actually feels like it might be worse to have the exact same claptrap, that same let's buy Greenland level of thinking come from somebody who has just been nominated for a lifetime seat on the federal appeals court one level below the United States Supreme Court. But hey, just in case you thought that the problem in this country was that we didn't have enough out and loud proponents of ethno-nationalism on the federal appeals court of this land, hey, you know, you gotta start somewhere, so why not with him? Hey there, I'm Chris Hayes from MSNBC. Thanks for watching MSNBC on YouTube. If you wanna keep up to date with the videos we're putting out, you can click subscribe just below me or click over on this list to see lots of other great videos.